All right, welcome everybody to our latest Digital webinar. I'm Dr. Sheldon Drobot and I'm the missionary lead for environmental intelligence and sustainability at Ball Aerospace. Our latest webinar is about air quality, energy, climate, and public health and addresses the issue, isn't good air quality human right? Joining me today are our four panelists. Dr. Tracy Holloway, who is the Jeff Rudd and Jean Bissell Professor of Energy and Analysis and Policy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Pratik Shretha is a research engineer at the Residential Buildings Research Group at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Dr. Eloise Murray, who is the Associate Professor in Physical Geography at the University of College London, and Thomas Delgado, who is the CEO and founder of Pollution Solution. So to start the session and lay the groundwork to drive our discussion and enable you, the audience, to formulate your questions, each panelist will give a brief presentation. First up is Dr. Tracy Holloway. So let me give you a quick introduction to her and then she'll give her presentation. So again, Tracy is the Jeff Rudd and Jean Bissell Professor of Energy Analysis and Policy at University of Wisconsin-Madison, jointly appointed in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. She works at the intersection of air quality, energy, climate, and public health. And Dr. Holloway has been recognized as a member of the National Academy of Medicine, as a recipient of the Ascent Award from the American Geophysical Union Atmospheric Sciences Section, and with multiple awards for science outreach, diversity, and mentoring. Tracy serves as the two-time leader of the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Team, which connects NASA data with stakeholder interests in the air quality management and public health. And she chairs the Energy Analysis and Policy Graduate Certificate at UW-Madison. Dr. Holloway holds an BS with honors in applied math from Brown University and a PhD in atmospheric and oceanic sciences from Princeton University, along with a graduate certificate in science technology and environmental policy from the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. So in her presentation, Tracy will explore the characterization of global air quality problems and solutions and whether satellite data could be used to support air quality regulation. So Tracy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sheldon. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm excited to take part in this, uh, in, in today's webinar. I'm gonna focus today on how we know what's in the air. Because I think that, you know, if we wanna solve a problem, the first step is knowing what the problem is and having data to track our progress. So the title of my talk is Characterizing Global Air Quality Problems and Solutions. And I'm really speaking today very much from my perspective as the team lead of the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. This is a ongoing initiative led by NASA with researchers from across the US uh, working to bridge uh, real world air quality management and health data needs with the capacities of Earth observation technologies, especially satellites. So when we're really thinking about what's in the air, there are three main data sources we can draw from. The gold standard has always been ground-based measurements. These are instruments sitting uh, in cities and in parks around the world that uh, share the, that, that measure what's in the air uh, where the instrument is. So uh, they can be set up for various different pollutants uh, traditionally, they're very, very expensive, but uh, more and more low cost monitors are um, spreading around the world. But as you can see, the coverage of these ground based monitors shown here in this um, map that I took from the uh, organization openaq.org, it's highly variable around the world. There are almost no monitors over the oceans. And uh, the coverage is much higher in the United States and Europe than in other parts of the world. And even within the US, if you were to zoom in, uh, many states have very few monitors. And even within cities, there is no city that has adequate monitoring coverage to really characterize neighborhood by neighborhood air quality. So while these monitors are the gold standard, um, they're limited in their coverage and their cost. The second major way to know what's in the air is computer models. And computer models have the benefit of covering uh, the whole earth. Uh, they allow us to look at any chemical we want to. Uh, they even allow us to look into the future with projections or into the distant past with reconstructions of historical climate. 
Um, the only problem is they are a simulation. So one of the challenges in developing and applying computer models is making sure that they're reliable. And one way to do that is by comparing with other data sources. The third and final major source of data for what's in the air are satellite data. And this, uh, the uh, portfolio of satellites is growing, but it's been something where the idea of looking at satellite data, uh, looking at the atmosphere from space has been something that's been uh, part of our lives now since the 1960s, helping predict the weather and track hurricanes. But today there are satellites that can see chemicals in the air, uh, even though we can't see with the human eye. And these include gases, especially nitrogen dioxide, and indicators of particle loading in the atmosphere. And what's really exciting to be working at this interface is to uh, tell people that there are billions, literally billions of US dollars worth of equipment up in space measuring global air pollution every day. And most of the data are freely available um, to anyone to go to a website and download. So, um, so I think, you know, whereas it's expensive to set up a new monitor and it requires a lot of expertise to get going with computer model data, uh, much of the satellite data can be downloaded easily from pretty user-friendly web-based interfaces. One example of satellite data to characterize uh, changes in air quality uh, was really uh, popping up during the um, early stages of the COVID pandemic. This image here shows NO2 from the Tropomi sal satellite on the left panel in January 2020 prior to the shutdowns and in the right panel in February 2020 during the height of the shutdowns over China. And NO2 is a chemical we can't see with our eye unless it's in very, very high concentrations, um, but the satellites, it can pick it up quite well. So if you're interested in thinking about satellite data or learning more about the work of this NASA team trying to bridge uh, satellites and user needs, um, I'd encourage you to go to our website, which is haqast.org. Um, and you might wanna look at the tools and resources section which has a, a, a section getting started and lots of links. We're trying to make this um, an easy uh, starting point for users, whatever your level of expertise. And we would also welcome you to join us uh, this April in uh, Missouri in the United States at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, we will be having um, the meetings free to attend. And in fact, we have travel uh, funding for US attendees. Uh, sorry. We, uh, the NASA rules prohibit it from going international, um, but it also is broadcast hybrid and archived on our website. So I'll end there and look forward to the discussion. All right, thanks very much, Tracy. We'll be returning to some of your great points that you've raised later on. And just a reminder for the audience, if you came in late, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll be, we'll be answering and asking them at the end of all of our presentations today. So let me now introduce our next expert, Dr. Patik Shretha. Patik is a research engineer in the Residential Buildings Research Group at NREL. He's also a member of ASHRAE, and his interests and expertise include indoor air quality, environmental monitoring data acquisition systems, building energy modeling, and HVAC systems. He's currently doing research on the energy performance of 3D printed concrete homes, energy audits of multifamily buildings, and geothermal heat pumps in US homes. Prior to joining NRL, Pratik did his postdoc at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where he led several research efforts, including a large-scale DOE-funded field study to investigate the impacts of home energy retrofits on potential asbestos contamination of houses containing vermiculite insulation, the simulation of airborne SARS-CoV-2 aerosols within buildings, that's pretty useful information, and multi-zone airflow network modeling of research buildings. For his PhD research at CU Boulder, he studied the correlations between home weatherization, indoor air quality, and respiratory health of home residents during wildfire seasons using blower door testing, spirometry, and low-cost air monitoring instruments. Pratik is originally from Kathmandu, Nepal, and he enjoys hiking, biking, musical instruments, amateur astronomy, do-it-yourself aerospace and robotics, and 3D printing as his main hobbies. So in today's presentation, Pratik will examine the issues surrounding the current air pollution problem and air monitoring situation primarily in Nepal and how low cost instrumentation and citizen science efforts can augment existing air monitoring infrastructure 
as well as provide a better hyperlocal picture of air pollution dispersion patterns. He will also give a brief overview of a prototype drone mounted, drone mounted instrument box that is being developed by his team based in Nepal. So Pratik, looking forward to this, over to you. Thanks so much, Sheldon, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. And as uh, Sheldon mentioned, I will be presenting today on this um, effort that I'm doing sort of like with a voluntary uh, involvement in Nepal, which started a couple of years back in collaboration with a few, uh, a couple of institutions, which I'll mention in my uh, presentation today. Uh, and this has to do with um, hyperlocal mapping of air pollution um, in within Nepal. Uh, it's a very small scale project at this point. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you heard Dr. Uh, Tracy Holloway talk about larger scale, global scale measurements that are taken uh, from satellites. Uh, but you know, when we're talking about neighborhood scale, really, really hyperlocal data uh, that place a lot of these uh, developing countries, including Nepal, India, China, you know, um, we uh, face a great challenge in really defining that higher resolution of measurement. Um, and also, uh, we also wanted to treat this project as sort of an awareness uh, raising campaign in uh, starting in Nepal, maybe we'll expand later, um, but uh, that's where we got our motivations from. Uh, so uh, this is our team, uh, we have a couple of uh, academics uh, from Tribu One University Institute of Engineering based in Kathmandu. And this project really started with my collaboration actually with uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rakesh Chandrapati, who is the founder CEO of this company called Orion Space, which is based in Nepal. They actually specialize in uh, PICO satellite development. Um, and they express interest in environmental uh, monitoring uh, pro problems as well. So we discussed our interests and uh, as he expressed his interest, uh, we commenced on this project and we tied in uh, do um, Dr. Sudhi Patrai, uh, Mr. Kamal, Kamal Darvami, and uh, uh, Mr. Ashish Karki as well. Avinav Mainali was uh, one of the hardware engineers who helped us out with this project. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the main motivation was this uh, dire situation of air pollution that was plaguing uh, my hometown, uh, Kathmandu. Uh, and uh, oh, the situation was just getting worse and worse year after year. And we could just witness it real time with uh, a lot of road expansion projects, these development projects that are going on. And almost sort of, a, uh, you can almost say like a blind eye being turned uh, towards this dire environmental situation. So uh, we just felt the need to like do something about it. Um, and it's not just Kathmandu and Nepal, all the major cities are facing these sort of like very high levels of air pollutants. PM 2.5 is often reported almost 10 times what's the WHO standards at worst of seasons. So this is a huge problem, right? And we know we don't need to reiterate how bad air pollution is and how many people it kills each year. If you look at the national air monitoring within Nepal, uh, just like uh, Dr. Tracy was mentioning earlier, there's very few air monitoring stations spread throughout the country, which hardly provide any you know, data that's tied to geospatial characteristics. So we wanted to address that a little bit through this uh, project that is not just uh, hyper local focus, but also low cost so that it's easier to generate this data. So we turn to citizen science. Basically, there uh, are a lot of folks already starting to do this kind of um, data acquisition measurement at a very low cost scale, which can provide a lot of uh, insight into what's happening at a very, very tiny uh, spatial scale resolution. Uh, with with that uh, data, we can not only look at how uh, you know air pollution is spreading within different parts of the city, but how they are changing over time as well. And even at uh, individual scale, you can almost sort of get a sense of what your exposure levels are are like as you travel within uh, different parts of uh, a city or a town, etc. And there are a lot of gadgets, a lot of sensors, uh, tools out there that you can even wear around. They'll 
project their data onto your mobile phones. You can uh, hook them up to drones um, and even project your data real time uh, uh, in global platforms. So that was our motivation. So we uh, embarked on this journey of developing this one prototype uh, based on Arduino and use a few electrochemical sensors, uh, a PM 2.5 optical sensor, uh, and just give it a try and uh, just to see how it goes. And uh, the initial data looked good. Um, so we hooked that instrument box on top of a drone that was being developed by, so this, this uh, development of the instrumentation was done at Orion Space. Uh, and we hooked it up to a quadcopter drone that was being developed at the Triple One University uh, Department of Aerospace Engineering. Um, so uh, that development is still actually ongoing. It's, it's uh, an ongoing R&D project. Uh, and we are very open to uh, hearing from more experts, collaborating with more people and institutions. Uh, we are very open for uh, funding for further development uh, of this uh, effort as well. Uh, our bigger picture here is to really involve more students, more, uh, uh, you know, citizen science uh, people who really want to contribute, whether you're a student or not, uh, in, in data gathering as well as uh, uplifting of this, uh, uh, you know, general awareness about this uh, situation through data. And uh, we're also now starting to talk to a high school who are very interested in coming and learning about how we are developing this uh, prototype. And uh, maybe they can even help generate some of this data for us out in the field. So uh, talks are ongoing about that. Um, and uh, the ultimate goal really is to, once we have all that data, really host it in an open access database platform. Uh, that we can, you know, visually uh, demonstrate what's going on geospatially and over time, uh, and uh, assessing uh, impacts of smaller interventions. Like, for example, if a road was being built, which was very dusty as vehicles passed on, what happens before and after uh, a sort of temporary or permanent intervention strategy? Like, if if the road gets paved, or uh, even for temporary mitigation, if you have a regular watering schedule over the roads uh, and so on. And uh, what kind of uh, broader impact does it have in the surrounding neighborhoods? So uh, we really wanna get an insight on that, maybe potentially uh, encouraging stakeholders to do more, including the local governments uh, and really encouraging youth participation on this. And we are, uh, as I said, even though the project is really small being started in Nepal, we are open for global participation and global expansion ultimately. So. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please direct it to me. We don't have a website yet, but we're getting there. So thank you so much. Yeah, very good, Pratik. Really interesting stuff. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun questions for you in a, in a few minutes. But let me now move on to our third panelist, Dr. Eloise Murray. So Eloise is the Associate Professor in Physical Geography at University of College at London. She leads the Atmospheric Composition and Air Quality Research Group. And this group makes innovative use of data from multiple platforms, models, aircraft, satellites, lab, and field measurements to better understand the influence of humans on atmospheric chemistry, air quality, and climate at urban, regional, and global scales, which is pretty much all of them. Her work on the health burden of air pollution from fossil fuel use and from rapid air quality degradation in fast-growing cities in the tropics has received media attention from leading agencies such as the New York Times, the Guardian, Reuters, and the BBC. And I know she has a, a number of great publications on that that, uh, that I've looked at that I think the audience would like to see. So in her presentation, Eloise will focus on Africa as the next frontier in air pollution due to its rapidly growing population, lack of policies or enforcement of these policies, and limited on the ground measurements and capacity to conduct in-depth air quality research and inform air quality policies. She will look at the shift Africa is undergoing as the dominant pollution sources change from centuries old practices like open burning of biomass to the dramatic increase in abundance of urban sources, as well as agriculture and in particular ammonia from livestock and fertilizer use, which is increasingly dominant, the dominant source of fine particulate pollution for nations that have had air pollution controls in place for decades, leading to a decline in pollution from most sources except agriculture. 
So energy choices are also a key driver for poor air quality with a particular focus on the burgeoning charcoal industry across Africa. So Eloise, please take the microphone and, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Super, thanks Sheldon. I will load up my presentation. Um, there we go. Hopefully you're seeing the, the presentation mode. Yeah, so as Sheldon mentioned, and as Tracy very nicely set up, uh, there are parts of the world where we have very, very little ability to monitor air pollution from, from the ground. And so we become increasingly reliant on products uh, from satellite observations. And thankfully, as Tracy has mentioned as well, these are publicly available. So as long as you can gain the training in effectively using these observations, they can be really powerful in understanding the sources and evolution of air pollution in parts of the world where we are without ground-based observations. And the, across the African continent, largely in sub-Saharan Africa, we're really starting to see this shift towards the kinds of anthropogenic pollution, but also novel pollution sources uh, that we've seen in other parts of the world before we implement policies to try and address those pollution sources. But Africa does stand out as unique as well because it's anticipated that by 2100, the largest cities we've ever seen are going to be located in Africa. And so one of those examples is Lagos in Nigeria where it's predicted by 2100, it's possible that the city will be home to 88 million people. And so we can compare that to Tokyo today. And I think the number is about 40 million. So we're getting to the stage of unprecedented city sizes. And of course, there's a lot related to the design of the city, how to make the city sustainable, but also in navigating how, how people are going to survive in a city where there are really large air pollution sources. And so rather than forecasting to look into the future to see what the impact will be of future air pollution, we wanted to look into the past, into the recent past, using this long and consistent record of observations that we have from satellites. And we did this as part of a project that was published in Science Advances earlier this year, where we looked at these really, really rapid trends in air quality degradation, focusing on cities in the tropics that are forecast to be megacities by 2100 at least. In addition to looking at air quality degradation, we also looked at the combination of uh, changes in air quality as, that impact health as well as changes in population. And so these are some of the metrics that are shown on this map, uh, these maps on the left hand side showing fine particulate matter exposure trends from 2005 to 2018, where fine particulate matter, we breathe it deep into our lungs, it goes on to have adverse impacts on our health, and it's a ubiquitous uh, uh, impact on health. Whereas something like NO2 exposure, NO2 is also important. Uh, the trends indicate that NO2 concentrations are increasing rapidly in many cities across Africa and the, the increase in, is significant, but NO2's impact on health is not as extreme as it is uh, for PM 2.5. The global burden of disease is, is not as high. Uh, and we also took this a step further to estimate what the global burden of disease is associated with these trends. I'm not showing the results here, but importantly for Africa, we're currently seeing a little bit of a dampening effect on health. So the number of excess deaths from exposure to, to pollution because of improvements in uh, health services available across the continent. But of course, this kind of dampening effect isn't going to last forever. It's eventually going to saturate and we're going to see the kinds of global burden of disease uh, numbers that we're seeing currently in India and China uh, in the near future across uh, the African continent. So it really does stand out as the next frontier of, of air pollution, in particular if there are no policies put in place to uh, reduce the negative impacts of these pollution sources. And the mix of energy that's being used really determines to a large degree the pollution uh, sources and the, the PM 2.5, NO2 and all those other pollutants that are formed that impact health. This is not showing an exhaustive list of those air pollution sources, but just, just showing, showing some that are starting to stand out as emerging. Uh, these are power ships, so there are power stations on a ship, <laughs> effectively, as the, as the name says. And these provide, are supposed to provide a short-term source of energy, and they run on liquefied natural gas. But countries like South Africa that currently have an energy crisis are looking to this as a more long-term uh, energy solution. But we don't really know the emission factors of pollutants from these sources and what impact they will have on air pollution. And there will be an associated impact on climate as well. 
And more recently, we've seen large scale production and use of charcoal uh, in households that are increasingly able to afford charcoal over fuel wood. So this sort of fuel switching is taking place. Uh, and this also has influences of air pollution and different kinds of influences at the production stage. It's a very uh, low combustion efficiency process. And so the mix of pollutants are gonna be very different from the usage. And so a PhD student in my group put together an inventory of these emission sources and ran them through a model to determine the potential impact this will have on fine particles as well as tropospheric ozone, uh, identifying that we will have very, very large enhancements in these pollutants, in particular in urban areas where the use of charcoal is increasing rapidly. And so we can shift from somewhere like Africa, where we're seeing this transition from traditional bur uh, open burning of biomass as a dominant driver of trends of air pollution to anthropogenic sources in cities, and look at parts of the world where policies have been in place for a very long time. And so these regions have largely addressed or gone to large measures to reduce the, constant, the emissions of uh, PM 2.5 precursors like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, uh, with the exception of ammonia. Ammonia comes from agricultural processes, so predominantly from livestock and from fertilizer application, and it's going to eventually form fine particles in the atmosphere. It's an increasingly dominant source of fine particles in places like Europe, uh, the US, and also we're starting to see it having a larger influence in China where air quality policies are improving um, or at least reducing emissions of SO2 and NOx. And so what we're doing is exploring this with a focus on the UK uh, to determine what the impact will be of current legislation that really does nothing to address ammonia emissions versus if we actually adopted technically feasible solutions uh, for ammonia emissions with the potential to vastly reduce excess premature mortality, comparing excess premature mortality for the present day to some future scenario where we are adopting these technically feasible scenarios to try and motivate policymakers to implement them um, within air quality policy solutions. And so, of course, this isn't the only research that my group is doing. If you want to find out more about the, the work that we do, I've just included a link to our research group website. We work on research all the way from surface air pollution to the impact of rocket launches <laughs> on the atmosphere and climate. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions uh, related to the work that I've presented here, but also other work that my research group is, is doing. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Eloise. Fascinating stuff. It's really interesting to see the, trend, the the pathway we've gone through from our first three panelists on different kinds of monitoring, different places. And now for our fourth panelist, we're going to change gears slightly. And so let me introduce you to Thomas Silgado. He's the CEO and founder of Pollution Solution, a UK-based company known for its road vent product that Thomas invented. He has extensive knowledge and experience in outdoor ambient air pollution and road-based emissions. His personal mission is to improve the lives of millions of people globally by providing simple localized technologies to solve these macro issues. In the presentation today, Thomas will focus on the significant health, social, and financial benefits we could gain by improving outdoor air quality and how simple localized technology solutions can help address these macro issues. So Thomas, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Um, Yes, as you quite rightly say, today I'll be talking uh, about the, the benefits and about our cool product, Roadvent. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to see my, my screen any moment. Excellent. Yes. So um, my name is Thomas Delgado and I'm the founder of, of Pollution Solution. Uh, here today to talk to you about Roadvent. And uh, at present, we're able to use this claim of being the world's most effective solution for reducing roadside emissions exposure. Um, so what do we do and why? Well, um, our vision is to significantly reduce human exposure to air pollution uh, within urban hotspots from road-based emissions. Um, so typically in uh, urban environments, we have huge amounts of uh, emissions that come from road-based uh, vehicles, which obviously affect the health of anybody that lives, works, commutes, plays, uh, or studies within in or all around these, these uh, urban environments. Um, of particular importance are street canyons. Um, and the reason for that is that typically in these street canyon environments, uh, in urban environments, we have these big buildups 
of uh, pollutants in the roadway, which inevitably reach uh, the sidewalks where people are walking or cycling. Um, and the reason for that is really down to the architecture, uh, as I'm sure many people watching this uh, seminar today are, are very aware of, uh, where we have, as you can see on this right, right hand side diagram here, um, recirculating air that effectively continues to, to keep the pollutants at a low level in the streetway. Um, and as I'll show you in the following slides, we install road vent in the running carriageway, um, which effectively disrupts this typical street canyon effect and cleans the air. Um, so what is road vent? Well, road vent is uh, an engineered solution uh, to capture and clean pollutants that leave vehicles. Um, we're focused on capturing both exhaust gas as well as brake and tire dust. So this is about uh, removing pollutants that leave internal combustion engine vehicles as well as alternative fuel vehicles, whether that's hydrogen or electric vehicles. Um, and uh, what we do is we effectively install two linear slot drains, as you can see in some of the images here on the right hand side. These linear slot drains are connected with a pipe network under the road to a roadside air cabinet. And that roadside air cabinet both creates the suction as well as cleans the air. And I'll talk to you very shortly about that in a bit more detail. Um, so uh, some use cases really for our product, the list is, is fairly extensive. Um, and um, this is not a, a conclusive list here, but the obvious uh, use cases for our product are outside of schools and playgrounds uh, where arguably the most vulnerable um, people, children obviously are, are affected by air pollution, as well as busy junctions, traffic lights, um, hospitals, we're talking to the NHS in the UK at the moment about queuing ambulances. This seems to be an emerging issue um, that is, is gaining more traction at the moment. And of course, if we're going to encourage active travel, uh, well, we need to protect people who are going to be cycling or walking alongside the road. So um, again, we're, we're encouraging stakeholders in the UK to, to put in mitigation me methods to protect these people. Um, our product is a, is a globally patented solution in the UK, USA, Europe, China and Hong Kong. Um, and in the lead up to this product, which was launched in July of this year, um, We've been in a, a very extensive phase, you can say, of R&D, which, which lasted about eight years. And we've worked with, uh, been very, very grateful, in fact, to work with um, some of the leading professors in the UK, including Professor Frank Kelly and Professor James Lee, uh, with regards to guidance and, of course, information surrounding this air pollution uh, data, which, you know, without that, we wouldn't have been able to develop a, a solution as effective as this. Um, so... What is road vent and how does it work? So as I say, we install two linear slot drains into the running carriageway, as you can see in this uh, very simple uh, demonstration image in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, and to the left hand side, you'll see that effectively these linear slot drains are connected with a pipe network to a roadside air cabinet. And then within that roadside air cabinet, we're using pre-existing technology to filter this dirty air. Uh, that includes an electrostatic precipitator, HEPA filtration and impregnated activated carbon. So um, we are focused heavily on NOx adsorption, but um, probably uh, just as importantly, I would say actually particular matter and volatile organic compounds. Um, PM is obviously gaining a lot of traction in terms of uh, being associated to some very nasty illnesses, including dementia. Um, and we feel although, um, it, especially in the UK with, with the law being quite relaxed on particular matter, we're confident that the law is going to start to tighten down on, on PM as more emerging uh, data uh, comes through. So as I say, we create a vacuum in the road, which effectively sucks in this pollution. And also it dilutes this, uh, this pollution. So we're capturing at very, very high levels of concentration, really due to the level of, uh, sorry, due to the proximity uh, of the slot drains to the exhaust pipe and the brakes and tires. But also we're putting in a great deal of ambient air. So, um, this gives us a huge amount of dilution under the road, which creates uh, a dilution ratio of about 12,000 to one. So even without filtration, we're diluting this air from what is a very high level of concentration to a very low, almost insignificant level of concentration, and as well as filtering it. So um, doing a great deal of, of benefit to, to air quality. In terms of uh, efficacy, well, we had to, uh, we had to prove our product uh, independently. So. Uh, we employed a, a company called Cambustion, who consists of uh, Dr. Mark Peckham from, from Cambridge University. Um, they've conducted a study on road vent to ascertain its effectiveness. So they've run various uh, uh, scenarios. 
Uh, and the, the key metric that we uh, were able to use today and talk about is the fact that with RoadVent turned on in a typical roadway scenario, there's a 91% reduction in roadside emissions exposure, um, which we trust everyone watching this today will, will agree is fairly significant. We have a very small, uh, very brief, I should say, video here to give you a, a brief overview of what the product is and how it works. Um, now, we're using a smoke machine here um, to give you a visualization as to just how the system works. As you can see, it creates a level of vacuum in the street and it sucks in uh, emissions from both slow moving and stationary vehicles. So it's not just about static traffic. Um, it also works very effectively when cars are moving along as well. Uh, and this gives you a good visualization as to what happens when brakes, uh, brake and tire dust is emitted. Um, and the final part of this video that we'd like to show you today is really about the, the results. So uh, this is a, a snapshot from Cambushan's testing report. And very, very simply, it shows you with the road vent system turned off in the top half of the screen and with the road vent system turned on in the bottom half of the screen. Uh, this test here that we're looking at is, uh, is, is the effectiveness of road vent in a fast food drive through setting. So this is actually a private, a private sector issue um, that relates to the fast food sector, whereby workers who are serving uh, burgers and, and drinks um, throughout the day and are continuously being exposed to very high levels of, of uh, pollutants from their customers' vehicles. And uh, we wanted to ascertain how effective road vent was in mitigating that exposure. Uh, we're measuring NO and NO2 here to, to form NOx. Um, and as you will see, as I play this video, uh, in the top half of the screen, you, as, you, as you'll note, there's rather large spikes of NO and NO2. Uh, and in the bottom half of the screen with the road vent system turned on, um, almost zero readings, which is, which is uh, you know, obviously a profound effect. Uh, this second uh, snapshot here is actually about roadside exposure at the height of a child. Um, this is actually the reason I formed the business to improve air quality uh, for children at schools and playgrounds. So it's one that's very close to my heart. Um, obviously, children being shorter in height means they're... Um, rather unfortunately, naturally closer to the source of emissions. Um, and again, hopefully you saw from that snapshot there um, with the roadman system turned on, there's almost a nil level of exposure. And again, in the top half of the screen, uh, very high levels of spikes. Uh, and this final video here really shows you uh, the effect that road vent has on in-vehicle exposure. So we're talking about the level of pollution inside a car. I'm sure everyone's experienced this. Being sat behind a, a heavily polluting vehicle, you can almost smell the emissions inside your vehicle. Uh, and again, roadvent is highly effective at mitigating that. So um, that that's uh, that hopefully gives you a good efficacy uh, overview of our of the efficacy of our product. Um, so I mean, the benefits are rather vast, and I'm not going to read through every point here uh, within this presentation. But um, to summarise. Clearly, the main focus here is health, human health. Um, we all know the size of the issue. It's uh, one of the largest issues worldwide this, in terms of the threat to human health. Um, and I think that uh, I, I, would, I would bet money on the fact that uh, more, more data is emerging and obviously associating even more uh, ill health effects to, um, to exposure uh, from, from exhaust gas brakes and tires. Um, only three or four months ago now, as I mentioned earlier, we had this uh, study that's just been released linking dementia to uh, particulate matter exposure. Um, and rather unfortunately, particulate matter has also been found in the brains of unborn children. So it's cross crossing the placental barrier as well. Um, so from an economic perspective, uh, this uh, globally, air pollution is valued at costing the economy $8.1 trillion, uh, a, a rather a breathtaking number, which is 6.1% of, of global GDP. Um, so it's clearly a, a very, very large issue that's worth fixing from both a health and an economic perspective. Um, but then from a community perspective, we've seen this um, in every country that we've looked at. Um, this is also being labelled as, uh, rather shockingly, as an as a air quality apartheid. So what we mean by that, and what, what many people have said is, is that there's disproportionate exposure to people of low incomes. Um, 
communities uh, of colour and unemployed people are suffering on average 20% higher levels of air pollution uh, than areas uh, where there's white communities. So um, I think this is uh, something that can't wait to be resolved. Um, this is a, both a moral issue as well as a, a, a pandemic level problem uh, on a global scale. And uh, we are uh, now focused heavily on working with stakeholders um, to encourage proactive solutions like road vent to be installed to mitigate this exposure that's so so desperately needed. Uh, so, of course, there's many benefits in doing this. Um, achieving air quality targets is a key one for governmental organisations. Um, reducing the healthcare burden, uh, whether that's publicly funded or not, uh, clearly there's benefits in doing that. Um, reducing work and school days lost. Well, there's, there's clear links to cognitive decline and ineffectiveness within workforces uh, that are exposed to uh, levels of air pollution. And as I mentioned earlier, encouraging active travel. I personally would not ride a bicycle through a busy town or city because I know what's in the air and I'm sure many others do. So again, this is about protecting people um, and encouraging people to make that modal shift, to make that change. Um, and again, employers, this is really a compliance issue. Uh, we've, we've had many conversations with employers throughout the UK and the US now um, who are starting to see the benefits of protecting their staff, whether that's from a legal compliance issue or from mitigating class action lawsuits against them. I think the list goes on in terms of benefits. Um, and really, we need to push on those pressure points uh, like legal uh, compliance uh, to ensure that they do make change as quickly as possible. So. Um, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much for uh, listening to what I have to say and uh, look forward to the Q&A. All right, fantastic, Thomas. Very informative presentations by you and all of our panelists today. I think it's a nice mix of things. Well, let's head straight into what we call part two of our webinar, which is the Q&A. So for audience members, again, please make use of the Q&A button at the bottom to type your questions I'll be asking them to the various panelists as we move forward. So we've got uh, we've got a few preloaded questions that I'll start with, and then we'll roll onto some of the live ones we had. First one, Pratik, this is for you. We're gonna, I think, go on a little bit of a citizen science walk here for the first few questions. But let me start by asking you, Pratik, how accurate are the instruments that you are developing? So that's a good question. Uh, these are low cost sensors. Um, and these are not like regulatory grade. There are, there, there's a vast process of certifying an instrument of, you know, accurately monitoring under different circumstances, uh, what particular pollutant you are measuring in. So the regulatory monitors that are placed in uh, certain locations by, you know, governments to monitor air quality, those are like, they have to go through a stringent uh, process of vetting. But these are like off the shelf, almost uh, you know, low cost sensors. So the accuracy when you put them side by side, at first it doesn't look that great. But we really have to look at the application of uh, what we are trying to do. These are not like regulatory monitoring or you know, uh, mission critical life or death situation kind of things, right? We are trying to get a generalized picture of how air pollutants move around, uh, both in space and time. So it's, uh, you know, the uh, way to quantify the performance of these sensors generally, uh, there are lots of reports out there uh, if you wanna do a research. Uh, they are actually very simple. They are set side by side with a reference grade instrument and we just look at the correlation, straight uh, regression between the two data sets and uh, the way generally we quantify the performance uh, efficacy is through a simple coefficient of determination, also known as R squared, between the two data sets. Um, and generally, they fall somewhere between you know, 60 to 90% or 0.6 to 0.9 range, uh, depending on the uh, pollutant being measured uh, and uh, the, the cross sensitivity. Uh, if you're trying to measure something like NO2, there will be another cross sensitivity with uh, something else that's out there in the atmosphere like ozone, right? So um, there are limitations, but for depending on the context and application of these sensors, they perform good enough uh, for our type of application. Um, I would say they're not that bad. They're, they're obviously not as great as reference grade uh, instruments, but you know, 
they perform good enough, uh, trustworthy enough. Um, so you really have to pay close attention to calibration process for these. Um, just because you got data doesn't mean it's really accurate. So a little bit more insight and uh, knowledge is required to uh, work with these uh, lower cost sensors. Yeah, thanks, Pratik. And I think it brings to mind the idea that it takes a village, right? We, we hear about that for lots yeah. of different uses. It probably applies here as well, that we have the gold standards and we need those, but we can't have them everywhere. The low costs have a role to play. But let me ask you uh, another question from the uh, from the side, um, from well, one of the questions we got about the calibration, which you mentioned. So in, in your, maybe it's too early, but let's just talk about this a little bit. How many times do you think you need to calibrate those instruments, how often, how long will be the lifespan of one of these instruments? Is that kind of information that you guys have yet? Uh, we were working on that. As I said, this is an ongoing R&D project uh, and it really uh, depends on, uh, so we have like lots of different kinds of sensors, right? There's NO2, SO2, PM2.5, and the, what we call drift. Uh, that's the difference between what uh, the instrument is expected to measure and the difference over time that the measurement is uh, deviating away from that expected measurement. That really depends on the sensor itself. So if let's say we have PM2.5, NO2, SO2, ozone sensor, and then one of them, the ozone, if it drifts fastest, that means our whole instrument box has a you know, sort of lifespan of that drift span which goes out of spec so um i would say based on my previous experience for this particular one we haven't gotten to that stage yet but based on my previous experience with similar sensors per season uh, is a good idea so about uh, you know three to four times a year uh, setting them aside with a reference grade monitor and trying to look at the data and applying drift correction factors to the data set is a good idea Okay, thanks very much. All right, Tracy, we have a question for you now on climate change and specifically, how will climate change solutions like renewable energy affect air quality moving forward? Yeah, thanks, Sheldon. Um, well, when we're thinking about uh, the connections between climate change and air quality, um, you know, there are two different issues in the sense that climate change is predominantly affected by carbon dioxide, which is a long-lived non-reactive gas. Whereas the air quality challenges we're talking about here are reactive gases and particles that impact human health um, and uh, are immediate uh, major um, health issues around the world. The, the good news is that even though these are two different issues, they have many of the same sources. So when we start implementing solutions, they can be win-win. Uh, both carbon dioxide and all of the sort of traditional air quality pollutants come from combustion uh, of fuels. And so when we're, as we move away from combustion of, of fuels, we get cleaner air and reduce carbon dioxide. Now, uh, the good news is that almost every solution to climate change, almost everything we do that reduces carbon dioxide emissions also makes the air cleaner. And that includes uh, moving from coal to natural gas and moving from natural gas to non-emitting sources like wind and solar, nuclear, and other um, renewable uh, energies that are non-emitting and have don't have combustion. Um, so as we think about uh, moving to more electrification, that opens up the opportunity to move to more non-emitting energy sources. So uh, just you know, in Thomas's talk, he was talking about roadway emissions. Well, if, if it was all electric vehicles on the roadway, they wouldn't be emitting anything. Um, and if that electricity were coming from uh, wind and solar and other non-emitting sources, then we would have the opportunity for a zero carbon and zero um, air pollution energy source. Um, so I think that one of the, the challenges, though, is that in many countries, like here in the United States, air pollution has been regulated going back 50 years. Um, but that has led to great improvements in the in reactive air emissions, but not any big impact on carbon emissions, because there are a lot of end of pipe technologies that can go on to cars and trucks and power plants and industry 
where we remove the air pollution, but don't do very much with the carbon or even sometimes increase the carbon emissions. So I think that one challenge as we look to the future is to think about how can we get a double win for energy system changes. And uh, Eloise mentioned in her talk about how you know fuel types strongly affect what's being emitted and how models can be used to estimate what that will what the impacts will be. And I think this idea of using computer models to look into the future and inform energy choices um, in around the world, including in growing cities like Africa, it's a huge opportunity for advanced science to support decision making around energy uh, analysis and, and energy policy. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Eloise, let me just kind of follow up with you on that last point. How much uh, like uptake have you seen so far from policymakers or interest from policymakers in looking at the models that you're working on to talk about the mix of pollutants and how we can regulate them? Yeah, most of my experience engaging with policymakers has been within the UK, and there is certainly a lot of a lot of interest from policymakers in understanding the kinds of tools that we're using, the ways in which our tools are informative and perhaps need, need a little more work to improve. Uh, and also understanding from a sort of top-down perspective using the satellite observations, um, perhaps how uh, we can improve the tools that policymakers are using to understand things like emissions of ammonia, emissions of other air pollutants that go on to form PM 2.5. There are other people who have obviously engaged far more extensively with policymakers across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm part of the Health Effects Institute and they have a workshop coming up where it is essentially this knowledge exchange between uh, members of the Health Effects Institute and policymakers and other stakeholders um, across East Africa, at least for this initial workshop. And, and it's really having that kind of conversation of what are the policymakers' needs, what kind of tools are there available, how can we establish formal collaborations um, to improve capacity across the, the continent in both human capacity as well as the tools and um, skills. Uh, and of course, uh, economic capacity, which is always a, a huge hindrance. Uh, yeah, sort of developing those uh, formal links and um, ensuring that the kinds of research that we're doing is also informing uh, policy. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Eloise. I, I think that's a really important point is the research that we're all doing is fundamentally interesting, but unless we're connecting it to the end users, the stakeholders, the policymakers, we're just not getting that impact that we, that we ultimately all need. So that sounds like a great conference and a great set of things you're doing. So Eloise, let me stick with you for the next question here and focus specifically on sort of the, uh, the idea, uh, I think around ammonia and what are some of the solutions that have been proposed or are there, have there been any solutions proposed to reduce the air pollution from uh, agriculture? Yeah, so there's researchers who put together um, emissions for, say, some sort of time horizon, perhaps 2030. And by 2030, these emissions of air pollution precursors uh, have some sort of magnitude of emissions based on whether we adopt current legislation or whether we adopt maximum technically feasible uh, solutions. And so within this maximum te technically feasible solution scenario, they've incorporated readily available uh, solutions. So for ammonia, this includes things like low nitrogen feed. Uh, it includes covering uh, manure storage um, so reducing the amount of ammonia that volatile, volatilizes from that source into the atmosphere, uh, improved manure spreading as well. The simple practice of spreading manure can change how much ammonia is released into the atmosphere. Having air filters and scrubbers in um, livestock housing, which for me, I always think of uh, scrubbers being in like a power plant, but there's also scrubbers you can apply to um, animal housing. Uh, and then also moving away from urea-based fertilizer, which tends to be quite efficient at releasing ammonia into the atmosphere. But of course, whether or not farmers will take this up um, really depends on legislation. And of course, I'm, I'm sympathetic to farmers. It is particularly challenging to be a farmer, <laughs> um, or maybe from a UK perspective, maybe this applies everywhere else, but it is a particularly challenging field to stay in. And we are very reliant on farmers. They provide us with our food source. 
And so we want to make sure that if this is adopted, it is actually economically feasible. Um, but there are, of course, substantial benefits that we've been able to quantify. You know, there's um, a substantially larger decrease in the global in the burden of disease for the UK if these kinds of measures are adopted. All right, thanks. Thanks very much. That's a great answer. So let's switch gears a little bit. Thomas, next question is for you. Do you think road vent could become the road pollution equivalent of the cat's eye? And uh, can you comment on the cost of installation and how that compares to cat's eyes? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good uh, analogy to use actually, Sheridan, because the cat's eye was actually formed as a result of people, you know, crashing their cars and safety concerns because they couldn't see in, in low uh, light environments and or fog. Um, so it's a, it was a health issue. Um, and clearly air pollution is also a health issue. So they are to a certain degree uh, comparable. Um, we, we're speaking to stakeholders um, and, and asking them to consider road vent as a piece of key uh, critical national infrastructure um, that assists us in moving across to uh, lower polluting and or, or zero emission vehicles over a period of time. This is going to be a transition, right? This is not going to be something that happens instantaneously overnight. And with circa 40,000 people a year dying in the UK alone, um, we feel that even if this was to take just some eight or even, you know, proposed 10 years, um, this is a worthy cause. You know, this could effectively save 400,000 plus people's lives in the UK alone. Um, in terms of cost, yes, uh, I mean, per system, you, there's an upfront capex of about £60,000. This is an infrastructure solution that's installed into the road. Um, so it's not cheap. Um, we're, not, not, we're not saying that it is cheap, but what it is, is, is a long term solution. This effectively then allows um, cities to be future-proofed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of emerging science uh, with regards to particulate matter from brakes and tires, um, and also correlation between electric vehicles being heavier and without regenerative braking, um, they actually can emit more particulate matter than uh, some internal combustion engines, just, uh, just due down to the weight of the vehicle. Um, so yes, we do see the analogy in terms of um, comparison to a cat's eye. There's a little bit more to it than that in terms of installation, um, but nevertheless, it's a piece of critical national infrastructure that's, um, that's there for safety. So yeah, see the comparison completely. Yeah, for sure, I get the point about the cost as well. We see that on the satellite side too, but I mean, the other part of it is what is the cost of a life, right? Where it's potentially saving a lot of lives and, and there's a pretty significant number on the statistical value of a life, which we can debate some other time, but but nonetheless, sure. it, what, <laughs> yeah, what, do you, uh, what do you think exactly? So Tracy, let me, uh, let me switch back to you for a second here. I've been, I think, skirting the issue of air quality regulation a, a little bit. How do you think satellite data could be used to support air quality regulation? And I don't know if you want to color your answer by regions of the world, because it might be different. And so over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sheldon. Um, well, around the world, different nations and different cities have their own approaches to air pollution regulation. Um, there are, though, I'd say, you know, a few steps in the process where um, information on what's in the air plays a key role. And one is um, understanding what the problem is. Um, two is implementing whatever regulations are on the books. Um, three is tracking progress toward uh, goals. And then uh, four is using that information to support new uh, potential uh, adjustments or expansions on regulations. And many of these roles are served by ground monitors where they exist. Um, so when I think about what is the role of satellite data for air pollution regulation, one question is where can satellites uh, complement ground monitors doing something similar, basically tracking uh, emissions, uh, uh, evaluating what's in the air away from monitors, um, that kind of thing. Um, but I think there's another set of questions, which is, can satellites do some things that ground-based monitors can't do? do? Can they serve a different role in some cases in um, regulatory structure? And, you know, I think this is really where uh, it's a fun, creative process as a scientist, because, you know, scientists, we like to ask 
questions and answer questions. And, you know, when you say we have this amazing toolbox of data, um, how can it support um, decision making in new ways? And I think that, you know, one example of that is um, citing the monitors. We recognize that monitors are actually measuring what's at ground level, what people are breathing, but um, the citing of those monitors um, has, to my knowledge, I've heard through one uh, uh, previous webinar a couple of years ago uh, that one country did use uh, satellite data to potentially cite monitors, um, but I it, that is not a common use of satellite data. And I think it could be because if satellites are showing where hotspots could be, that really could be a nice way to inform citing monitors to make sure we're measuring what we want to be measuring. I think um, evaluating model performance is another important way that satellites can support um, decision making because these computer models, like we've mentioned, are so powerful in assessing what if questions, how can we achieve clean air goals. Um, another a role that satellite data can play that I think is is more challenging for ground monitors, but very policy relevant, is looking at air pollution transport. And I think this is a big reason why um, uh, South Korea has invested in this cutting edge GEMS geostationary satellite that provides hourly air pollution data over Asia is because of satellite capabilities to see large scale patterns and transport. Where monitors show you what is in the air at one place, it doesn't tell you where it came from. And while there are analysis approaches that can provide, you know, backtracking of air parcels, um, the kind of large scale patterns that we get from satellite data, especially as they're changing hour by hour, um, offer a new way to be thinking about cause and effect, especially when you're looking uh, across international um, uh, borders, across state borders, or even, you know, thinking within a, in a small scale region, how much is a city affecting the nearby communities. So I think that, you know, I see it I see satellites playing a lot of different roles. And one of the things that's been exciting in our work with the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team is to be working with a wide range of decision makers from the national EPA here in the United States to the Health Effects Institute uh, that Eloise mentioned to nonprofits, to city mayors. And they all have their own questions and their own challenges where additional data would be useful. And so I find it really exciting that we're not trying to push data into a particular decision framework but more have a back and forth of understanding where is more information helpful and which of those information needs can be met by current, future, or next generation satellite products. Yeah, great answer. I'm in total agreement with you, Tracy. And I think the idea of satellites being part of an integrated observing network is, is really where we're probably heading in the future. There's no one golden solution that does everything properly and, and well. And just to follow on with, with, with you mentioning GEMS, there'll be a, a, for everybody in the audience, if you're not aware, there'll be a very similar instrument launched in the spring of 2023 for, for North America. And uh, again, that data is freely available. So do follow up with, with us afterwards if you're interested in, uh, in obtaining any of that data. So thanks for that. Uh, let me go back to Pratik for our next question. And Pratik, you mentioned citizen science. Seems like a great way to engage with the broader population so I want to start with you and, and, and get your opinion on really the role and the value of citizen science. But I, I also would like to open that floor to Eloise and, and Tracy for sure, because I think you'll have some interesting comments as well. But critique first to you. Sure, yeah. So uh, obviously uh, we see great value in this. Um, it's a great tool to engage people uh, to really increase the level of awareness uh, in, in a topic. Uh, you can imagine, like, if someone is interested in collecting air quality data, they're very highly unlikely to do, like, at a personal scale, things that would harm the air quality that much, right? So that was our initial approach in doing this. Um, you know, we, we see, like, knowledge out there, but a lot of ignorance and turning a blind eye towards that as well, especially in developing countries. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in a city where 
the air wasn't that bad initially, but the influx of population uh, into the city because of various uh, political and a lot of other reasons, it worsened the air quality and even, um, you know, sort of uh, educated people not uh, doing what they're supposed to do, trash burning, for example, like these kind of uh, activities really demonstrate, you know, the level of ignorance that the general population has in the things that are discussed in public forums, but not really practiced at a personal scale. Um, so I feel like with this effort, what we were really wanting to leverage was, first of all, the interest of primarily uh, starting with the youth, in uh, STEM and uh, scientific things like this, data collection, putting together sensors, instruments, being excited about projecting that data in an open source platform, and really conveying that message to the broader society in terms of what activity uh, you know really caused a spike in the air pollution or what um, interventions that really cause a decline in, in the air pollution. And as they can see, uh, real time. There are also challenges that come along with it. Um, if you are engaged in citizen science uh, with your own instrument set up in your backyard, how uh, trustworthy can the data be? Will it actually provide the real uh, picture of what's happening out there? Um, and to really like vet, um, you know, the accuracy of the instruments, maybe uh, we can have people who want to host their data in these platforms have uh, also, calibration information uh, presented uh, in, in the platform itself as well. Uh, again, it's not a regulatory level um, exercise, so it's going to be challenging to uh, really get uh, more trustworthy and accurate information on this. But in, in terms of a general picture, uh, we can come up with maybe smarter ways to, uh, you know, vet the data at a higher level um, with spatial correlations and saying like, yeah, this is uh, this particular, in, in this neighborhood, there are 12 sensors, 11 of them are uh, behaving the way that we expect them to, but maybe using some machine learning algorithm or something like that, you know, uh, parse out like the one particular instrument that's way off and maybe there's some, some instrumental issues with that. You know, those kind of challenges exist, which also means, uh, there needs to be a decent amount of knowledge and uh, skill that comes along with citizen science. And as more and more people get engaged in this, I really feel like the overall education level uh, and our uh, you know, skills of the people involved in this go up over time. So I think it's a great, uh, great tool, particularly for uh, students interested in STEM but not limited to that, of course. And uh, the data that we generate out of this uh, can augment the existing air monitoring infrastructure and also inform uh, agencies at higher levels as well. Okay, fantastic. Eloise, let me kick that same question to you, but maybe try to color it with some thoughts from African and tropical cities where you've been focusing a little bit. Yeah, I don't speak with the same experience as Pratik. You know, I haven't engaged with the use of citizen science data or maybe distributed uh, technology that can be used by citizens. But I think for parts of the world where there, there perhaps isn't a policy infrastructure in place to be able to uh, implement changes that would lead to decline in air pollution, there is some degree of empowerment that happens from owning your own monitor where you can see exactly how your behavior can change uh, how much you're exposed to air pollution. But then, I mean, Pratik has already mentioned this, that the quality is also important. There are, unfortunately, um, low cost sensors and other instruments floating around that aren't reliable. And so it provides misinformation, poor guidance on making decisions to reduce your exposure. So I think that's all that I have to say on the topic. I don't have first hand experience um, with citizen Perfect. science data. Great. Yeah, thanks. And Tracy, on the Haycast front, how much discussion has there been about citizen science and the role it could play? Um, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. And I think both in the sense of, you know, uh, the, low, the role of low cost sensors, which uh, to my view have a lot in common with satellite data as a new data source that is coming into a, the air pollution management framework. But I would also extend that to say that, 
you know, these websites that are distributing satellite data, and a good example is NASA Worldview. If you go to NASA Worldview, immediately you get a beautiful image of today on your screen, and that's quite intuitive. You can zoom in, you can adjust the days. Um, there's just a lot uh, that citizens with no particular scientific training can do to see and build uh, familiarity with air quality. So I think that there's the citizen science of actually going out and taking measurements, but there's also citizen science that may be done with publicly available data and tools, including satellite data. Uh, actually, I gave a talk um, at the uh, Adler Planetarium in Chicago a few years ago at a, a public uh, event on science outreach. And I brought a computer and had people, you know, type in their birthday and zoom in on their hometown. And it was a very personal and participatory activity that was completely free. All they needed was a computer. Um, and one thing I'll just add to what Pratik said about, you know, engaging students. I absolutely agree that these are great tools to connect with students who are already interested in uh, science and technology and, um, and engineering and math. But I also think that engaging um, students in air pollution through using these data and tools is a great way to reach students who might not be interested in STEM, but could be. I think that this idea that, you know, you will know at 18 years old, 100% if you're going to be a STEM major or not is, is false. There's a lot of, of students who are interested in equity and justice and, you know, public health and uh, policy, who I think could be brought in to the excitement and the importance of climate and air issues through these hands-on or you know, computer-based activities, and then may see that, wow, like I didn't think I was interested in chemistry, but now I am. So I'm not trying to make everybody a STEM major, but I think that recognizing that we want to reach a wide range of students and highlight the diverse um, career and research opportunities that are out there, it's a nice way for us to be growing the community and brain power solving these important problems. All right, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, and while we need lots of STEM majors, I think there are critical roles that the social sciences and the humanities are also playing for this. And, and it's exciting for me when we get everybody together to talk about these issues. So, so thank you. Um, Eloise, over to you for the next one. I think the idea of COP has gone from being a interesting niche conference in, in the first maybe 15 or 20 years to the last 10 years where it is, uh, it, it, it's in the public lexicon now, right? We see it on, on the news when these COP events are happening in Glasgow and Egypt this year. But when it comes to the actual COP talks, climate change is what dominates. Do you think enough is being done to address air quality at these conferences? Yeah, the, the conversation is predominantly around relatively long-lived greenhouse gases, um, but air pollution does play a role in altering climate. We've seen from um, Europe and North America cleaning up their air that we now have fewer reflecting aerosols um, over those parts of the world, and so we're seeing a speed up of, of changes in climate because they're no longer reflecting away as much sunlight. Um, there's brown carbon, there's black carbon, those are very effective absorbers of radiation, and so they warm the local atmosphere. And then, of course, ozone in the troposphere is, though short-lived, also a potent greenhouse gas, but they don't get as much attention at the COP talks as the longer-lived greenhouse gases. So I think there's definitely room to, to bring that into, into the discussion. I've never been to a COP meeting. I'm definitely not going next year. It's not in a country that I really want to visit. <laughs> um, but I think certainly I would like to see them um, include that in the, in the conversation more. But of course, I'm happy for other panel members to maybe weigh in if they've attended any of the the COP meetings or participated in them. Yeah, very good. Any of our other panelists want to weigh in on that? Okay, no, hearing no. Well, let's move on. Tracy. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in. So okay, uh, I, I really feel like uh, you know, identifying concrete um, steps to meet the goals that have been set, I, I really feel like uh, you know more could be done there. Like we know the issues, we know uh, the you know problems that surround these topics, but just reiterating the fact doesn't help. You know? What can we do in the next five years 
and how we can really like put the pressure on the governments that are participating and holding them accountable for what they said five years ago, those kind of things. I feel like identifying more concrete steps, I feel like there's a lot more that can be done. For sure. Yeah, very good. Uh, all right, Tracy, uh, we've got about 10-ish minutes left. So let's uh, let's try and get through a few more questions here. Here's an easy sounding one, but I think the answer not so easy uh, or straightforward. Can satellites detect near surface particulate matter at two and a half microns? Uh, not directly. Uh, satellites uh, see the column of air uh, stretching from the surface all the way up to space. And really what they're measuring is absorption of light. So uh, there's uh, a few different metrics that come from satellites that can be used to infer the, the loading of particles in the atmosphere. The most common metric is called aerosol optical depth or AOD. Um, and so satellites detect AOD. And if you look at a map of AOD, for example, on the NASA Worldview platform, you'll see high levels over areas that do have high levels of near surface PM 2.5. Um, so as a qualitative metric, AOD works very well. But when we're really trying to assess what people are breathing at the surface, we can't just use satellite data. Instead, um, there are different data fusion uh, products that take computer models, satellite data, and ground-based measurements and merge them together to have sort of a recipe for near-surface PM 2.5, taking all available data. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, the, the PM 2.5 coming out of this combination depends in part on what ingredients went into the recipe and in part on the recipe itself, because there are different ways to weight information from these um, sources. Uh, right now, I would say the leading group developing these fused data products to estimate near surface PM 2.5 is Randall Martin's group at the at Washington University in St. Louis. And they have um, multiple different products, different recipes and ingredients available on their website um, free for download. So um, that's, I'd say, the main source of information going, for example, into the Global Burden of Disease Report. And often when you see global estimates of near surface PM 2.5 in health studies or other applications, they're often coming from Randall's group at WashU. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Um, Pratik, the next one is, is for you. One thing we haven't mentioned yet is this idea of microplastics in the air. And uh, the UN met earlier this year and, and decided that uh, by 2025, we want to have a globally legally binding treaty on dealing with plastics in our environment. But yet, Pratik, have you guys thought much about the issue of microplastics in air quality, how much we're breathing in every week, et cetera. Yeah, the speciation of the particulates that we really breathe in, it's really, really hard to do with low cost sensors, um, at least at the, for the time being. Uh, it takes advanced instrumentation and technology to do that. Obviously it is uh, a huge issue. Um, and once again, like the, addressing of that part comes from the regulatory side, at least for now, uh, until we have, you know, cheap enough technology to quickly assess and say, yeah, these are the species, this is like the heavy metals, these are the plastics, these are, you know, black carbon soot that we are breathing in. Um, so as of now, it's all lumped together. It's just fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. Um, but that is obviously cert, uh, something that we should all pay very close attention to. Um, uh, we keep hearing in the news every now and then that uh, certain governments, uh, certain countries have banned the use of um, plastics of such thickness and uh, that's good, but uh, really a long-term solution uh, needs to be identified by how we can incorporate you know, more uh, environmentally friendly materials in not just plastic bags, but everything else that's plastic out there, right? So. Um, and emphasizing um, recycling infrastructure. So all of these uh, sort of tie in to that. So yeah, as of right now, like you know, the smaller scale projects that we are targeting, we don't speciate. Uh, I've seen research that have been done in all parts of the world that do speciate things, 
there is data out there, but um, yeah, that's obviously something that we need to pay close attention to. Yeah, fantastic. And, and Thomas, let me kick this one over to you as well. In, in your presentation, you know, you didn't mention microplastics specifically, but can you talk a little bit about what Roadvent might be able to do with that? Yeah, sure. It's not our core focus, if I'm being completely honest. Um, but that said, our system does also ingest surface water. So obviously being in the run in, in the carriageway, um, naturally we pull in uh, normally expected surface water from the carriageway, um, which of course includes uh, particulate matter, microplastics, and um, to a certain degree mitigate some of the resuspension that we see um, in, in normal modeling um, and other studies that have kind of shone a light on that. Um, within our system, we actually have a sump pump, which has a microplastic filter in it. So um, that's something that's not currently being done in, in the carriageway. As I say, normal drainage systems in the carriageway are just open slots into the sewer network. Um, so there is no form of, of mitigation at that stage. Um, but as I say, our, it's not our core focus, but nevertheless, it's been engineered in. So um, yeah, the sump pump we have filters down to a size of 0.3 microns. So um, yeah, we're well on our way to, to mitigating some of that um, microplastics that would be normally pumped into the sewers. Um, as I say, we filter it out before before it gets there. Great. Uh, and then one other quick follow-up. We had a question on how significant are microplastics in the overall air quality picture. And I think the answer is a little bit to be determined. This is a newer scientific endeavor. There's a lot of work being done with various airborne and satellite uh, radiances right now to, to correlate them with microplastics. And so that research is, is ongoing, maybe uh, come back to us in, uh, in a year or so, and we'll have, I think, more information there. So let's see, we've got about just a minute or two left. Eloise, I'm going to set the last question to you and deeply apologize to everybody that's asked the question we haven't got answered. Ian is recording them all. We will uh, we'll follow up with those people that we didn't quite get the answer as, as to in this time frame. But Eloise, we've had a couple of questions come up on the idea of population growth. And I think the general idea here is that as you get more people, even if you mitigate uh, some of the air pollution things, you still could potentially have worse air pollution, right? So could you talk a little bit about, uh, about population growth and air pollution and some of the issues there? Yeah, I definitely, I know the question was related to US population by 2100, and I'm probably not the right person <laughs> to answer that, not being in the US, and focusing more of my research on um, Africa and the tropics in general. But I mean, the populations are growing everywhere. Urbanization is certainly contributing to the population growth in cities. And unfortunately, if we're thinking about exposure to air pollution, this this makes it harder to reduce population exposure to air pollution overall. So we sort of have to work a lot harder to develop stricter air quality um, measures to try and reduce air pollution as population increases, just because as a, a population in a city grows, there's an increase in general population exposure to air pollution. But it, so it certainly makes it, the work a lot harder for regulators to try and reduce air pollution in, in cities. Fantastic. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And this is going to conclude today's webinar, which has been organized by intermet.digital. I'd like to, again, give a big thanks to our panelists and you, the audience, for taking time today to join us. We hope you've gained some useful insights into how we might address the enormous challenges of public health, of poor air quality. If you have any further questions, or for those of you that had questions that we didn't quite answer here, please contact our producer, Ian Harper. His contact details you'll see on the screen shortly, and we'll get those answered for you. Also note a recording of this webinar will be available in the near future. We'll notify all of those who have registered for today's event. And as a plug for our next webinar, this will take a detailed look at extreme weather early warning systems. In the chair will be my colleague, Jan Dutton, the CEO of Prescient Weather, and it's going to take place in February. So to conclude today's proceedings, it's goodbye from our panelists, Eloise, Tracy, Pratik, and Thomas, and from me, Sheldon. To play us out, here is our contact information. Goodbye for now. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Intermet.Digital webinar.